Thanks, Marilyn. I really appreciate that. And um, I want to thank Susan uh, for this beautiful space, which is always a wonderful spot to be in. And I would encourage folks to look at these exhibits. They're very um, deep and inspiring um, and often surprising. So spend some time. You'll get some neat ideas, I think. Um, and I wanted to thank the uh, Amanda and the Resilience by Design team. It's been great working with them. And we're really pleased to be um, to be asked to play this uh, sort of science role in fusing the design process with some science, environmental science, regional science. And I think that's a great um, maybe innovation in this round of Resilient by Design. Hopefully it becomes a, uh, you know, a common feature of these sorts of competitions. And for us it's really exciting because we, um, you know, we're an applied science center. And so for us what's meaningful and um, satisfying is um, not so much publications, but our stuff being used to actually do something useful in the environment. So, so we're extremely uh, pleased to have anything we do be used by you guys. So, we like the we're happy for the opportunity. Um, so, uh, so today's lineup. Um, I realize you've had a long day. Going to not take it personally if anyone's nodding off. around the bay? What are the kind of the incipient um, prototypes that you might be able to draw on that are actually getting a lot of attention and being tested out? And I wanted to thank Santa Clara Valley Water District and Norma Camacho, the executive director, um, executive officer, who uh, has supported our role in, in the resilience by design process, um, both the briefing and the team consultations, which I'll, um, oh yeah, and I guess we were already introduced, so I don't really need to say anything about ourselves. But I did want to say that we will be presenting a lot of our own research from the Institute, from the 50 plus scientists there, but also drawing heavily from the broad and deep science community in the region. So, um, you know, from USGS, BCDC, Point Blue, um, UC Berkeley, Stanford, it, it's a strong science community that uh, we'll try to sort of point you to a lot of those resources through this presentation and through some of the other resources we have. So this kind of kicks off our engagement with the design teams. The idea is first this briefing to kind of introduce you to a lot of the topics and kind of information and ways of thinking about the Bay that are you know, currently um, taking shape. Um, but inevitably, it'll be somewhat uh, superfi I don't know, superficial. It'll scratch the surface. And um, so we're available in the research phase for questions and um, kind of follow up from this meeting uh, to help with site selection. But we imagine we will, so we're happy to be involved in that stage, um, probably more in the design phase. Hopefully, I find it's often good to be involved early on and kind of when ideas are being bounced around rather than just criticizing stuff later down the road. Um, we'd love to be involved in uh, helping with ideas and um, bouncing some of them around. So there may be sort of check-in points along the way that make sense. But those will be somewhat determined with each team and how they want to work. And you have a lot of resources, obviously, on your own teams. Um, so the contact for that uh, interaction is Katie. Katie, do you want to raise your hand? <laughs> uh, and we actually have a choice selection of our favorite recent reports that we think are relevant, the uh, information packet that we have 
one or two available for each team. So if you want to pick those up, you can come to Katie at the end. That might be a good way to dive into a bunch of relevant information right off the bat. So uh, a kind of underlying theme of our presentations today will be obviously resilience, but um, and focusing on ecological or ecosystem resilience, which is one major part of one main part of the foundation of community resilience, but only one of the aspects. We're gonna focus on that one. And our particular angle on that is trying to understand the real mechanisms that create resilience. Figuring that our landscapes use, are much more brittle and fragile than they used to be, the systems that we depend on, and that we, we've somewhat lost that inherent resilience, that capacity to adapt and adjust in our systems. And so how do we um, incrementally increase that so that we have more resilient systems. And so in that endeavor, we've developed with a number of scientists internationally and locally, uh, the landscape resilience framework, which lays out sort of the different ways to think about resilience in a real functional, practical way, and um, helps break those down so that we can really be doing projects that are um, addressing the appropriate scale, the key processes, the right types of connections and diversity and complexity, these different dimensions of resilience, if you will. So anyways, we're not gonna get into this in a whole lot of detail today, but this will be kind of underpinning. I'll be doing quite a bit of setting, Letitia process, Julie, kind of a, a bunch process and, and diversity and scale. Scale, we suggest these units that we think are, are a meaningful way to think about the bay and design in the operational landscape units. So this will be a theme and the idea being that if we connect, if we are addressing those dimensions of resilience and incorporating them in, in a you know, substantive way, we'll eventually be building back the resilience into the landscape cumulatively through individual projects. So that's the overall intention, of course, and, and reweaving the way these processes move through our settings. So jumping into the Bay Shore. Uh, I'm going to make a few fairly obvious, almost sort of no-brainer points, but they are not incorporated into planning at all, so I think they're worth making. So the bay has always been rising and expanding, right? It's been going up, and as it goes up, it gets bigger. And this has been happening for the entire incarnation of this bay, essentially since the last ice age. Glaciers started melting, the seas rose, so they've been rising for a long time, for 15,000 years. 10,000 years ago, they started entering the bay. And they were moving pretty quickly at that point. They are moving relatively rapidly across the low-lying areas. And so you had, um, you had substantial movement and changing in the shape and position of the bay um, on a decadal, certainly on a century scale. And then it slowed down a bit um, in the last few thousand years, and that's the kind of steady millimeter or two a year that we've been used to as human civilization for the last several thousand years. And it took essentially the shape of the, the contemporary, at least the historical um, bay in the last few hundred years. So interesting thing to think about in that context is that Native Americans, indigenous people, came to the bay area a little before that, probably 10, 12, 15,000 years ago. And so the, and, the base, the shoreline is such a productive area, people who are always living around the edge, right? So during this time, for thousands of years, the bay has been rising, changing shape, adjusting, and human civilization has been moving with that. Miles across the valleys for thousands of years. So that's the uh, natural relation, that's the long-term relationship between people and the bay. And so it's really dramatic what happened in the last 150 years where the bay had reached this, um, this point in its expansion around, right around the gold rush. And then within, mostly within about 50 years, 75 years, we reduced its size by a third. So we made it much smaller, really quickly. And of course, during a time when the sea level was still rising. So it was going up, but it wasn't going out. And in fact, we made it a lot smaller. So that's, that's where we come on the scene right now, essentially, is that's a, an odd sort of historical anomaly probably in the long-term history of this system, right? The bay is gonna keep rising, and this is a period where we made it much smaller, 
but the bay is gonna keep going up. And th these are a few different sea level rise protections. Logistics is gonna talk about this a little bit more. And you realize that they just keep going, right? Sea level is gonna keep rising for centuries. So the bay is just gonna keep expanding and expanding. And yet we established this um, concept or construct of the bay as a fixed, as a, of a shoreline, of a fixed shoreline. And so these are photographs, uh, this is a photograph of San Francisco around 1940. And here it is around now. And you can see a lot changes actually, like the rail yard gets redeveloped, the ballpark goes in, sorry, wrong direction. But look at the shoreline, the piers get kind of rearranged, but it's almost exactly the same footprint, the same relationship between people in the bay. And you see that here as well, more in the East Bay where the salt ponds are. And so we established this construct of the shoreline as a line, as a fixed place, people on one side, the bay on the other, it's sort of over there, well, over there. And it seems stable, and that actually has lasted for really close to a century. So pretty much all of our lives, anyone alive today has seen the bay as a pretty fixed object that's out there with a fairly defined, um, well-established relationship. But that, um, and to take that a step further, thinking about the region, um, I don't know if you guys agree with this, but I think people think of the Bay Area as kind of a mild environment, kind of a mellow place. Um, you know, we don't have hurricanes. There's not really even much weather, right? There's like no seasons. Um, we had a little bit of lightning last night and that people went to conniptions. Like, wow, that's so crazy. So it seems very relaxed. And, you know, the temperature is basically 62 degrees almost all the time. And, you know, no one has air conditioning, maybe a little bit more now. So there's a sense of kind of a gray, stable kind of environment. And that might have been somewhat true in the 20th century for some reasons I will explain, but probably not so much in the forthcoming century, the century in which we are right now embarking. So for a few reasons. One, earthquakes. So we had a really lucky run here since 1906. And it's not a coincidence because 1906 released a lot of energy and created this term I love, the protective stress shadow. So the 20th century, the rest of the 20th century was somewhat um, enveloped in this, this protective stress shadow by the energy being released. But we're moving out of that shadow now. And, um, and so there's a high likelihood of a, much, of, of a big earthquake that the likes of which we have not seen in a long time in the coming decades. And you can see that the era of development in the Bay, pretty much everything that has been built around here was built in that time frame in a very stable, kind of friendly environment. Similarly, mega floods. So that's even maybe a bigger deal than earthquakes because they can cover such a large area at once. And so mega floods, researchers are finding out, like Lynn Ingram and Mike Dettinger. Um, this is a paper in Scientific American. It's pretty fascinating. Mega floods could flood enormous areas. Um, it's atmospheric rivers, the kind of system we get that delivers most of our water, and they can park in one place for weeks at a time. It can rain for a month and cause flooding far beyond what we've experienced. And they tend to happen roughly every 200 years. When was the last one? 1862. So that's 100, 100 and something, 150 something. So again, we're ready for another one of those. Those are entirely likely in this century that we will have a massive flood beyond which we have seen before. So this is really important to me because I think it's easy to, to focus on the bay because it's so big and it's got the whole ocean connected to it. It's a little more intimidating than our little puny creeks that come around the back of the bay that come in. But those may be even the bigger risk, bigger threat. And that could happen any year. Like sea level rise is gonna take a while. So this is just as important. It makes it much more complicated, as I'm sure you know, is you have flooding coming from both sides of the line and potentially at the same time. So that, that takes it to a whole nother level. And of course, we do have some really low-lying areas. We don't really have bayous like Houston. We're relatively high and dry, but around the edge of the bay, there were places where people did not build for much of the 20th century 
and they were really swampy and low and water spread out, hard to drain. So those places still exist, but they have now all been developed, essentially. Final point on this theme, sea level rise, nice and steady, starting to ramp up a little in the 20th century. But this century, multiple times as fast. So all of these factors converge in a particular spot that you guys have been assigned or volunteered to work in. <laughs> so good luck. <laughs> sea level rise, really flat areas, unstable soils, bay fill and mucky areas. And then we put a lot of our most important infrastructure there too, of course, right? So it's not just people who live right around the edge of the bay that are at risk, we all depend on that. So I think of it as sort of a slow motion collision between land and water. It's slow motion and then it's episodic in moments. And that's a very dynamic spot to be. And that's where a lot of action is. And that's where a lot of the complexity is. So a challenging spot to work. But as you think about that, I think um, here's some of the processes that you may want to consider. And the overall point being both sides, both sides from the watershed side, and we'll continue this throughout this presentation, across the shoreline. So this is um, a hypothetical spot around the bay. I actually faked it, in case you're trying to figure out where it is, because I knew wherever I chose, somebody would get annoyed. <laughs> so this, I may actually made that myself. It's two places. I'm really proud. So after spending an hour and a half trying to get, find a good example that no one would get irritated at. <laughs> um, so coastal processes coming this way, but then also coming essentially from down below as the sea rises, um, you can put a wall across here, but the groundwater will still come up, as I'm sure you know. So it's not that simple. And then of course you have the fluvial processes, the, the floods and the sediment, all the important stuff happening there, potentially spreading into the, the built area, as well as the stormwater flooding, which is essentially trying to drain those really flat areas. And so, the idea of a line through here, a shoreline, becomes somewhat of an illusion. And I suggest we really want to be thinking about how do things go across, lat, um, you know, across perpendicularly rather than this sort of lateral way we tend to think about it. Same is true for ecology. If that was physical processes, uh, a lot of the species in ecology that we care about and um, are reg you know, regulated in some cases to care about, need this both sides of the edge. Clapper rails or Ridgeways rail um, needs to go into dry land at high tide. Herons and egrets use trees in the urban areas as their roosting sites and then they go into the bay to, to hunt each day, to feed. The Western Pygmy Blue, personal favorite, um, occupies this edge. No one else really cares about it, but I think it's cool. Um, definitely not regulated. Um, steelhead, which are a very important species. So there's salmon essentially going up many of these small little creeks. Don't be fooled by their small size. Um, and migratory neotropical migrants, like um, the yellow warbler, Wilson warbler here, hopscotch through these urban areas, f f needing to find resources to continue their migration south and then north. And of course, this is because the area on this side, it's easy to focus this side, but this side is important too. It was seasonal wetlands and wildflower meadows, willow groves, oak savannas. All these habitats were there and are actually possible to be brought back in elements and are being incorporated into creative projects as we speak in terms of stormwater, detention basins and LID, urban forestry, uh, campus designs, and I think we're starting to get better as scientists at getting specifications and guidance to the design and planning community, how big, how far apart, what's connected to what, so the pieces of the puzzle, so that that can enter into the planning process, um, as in this report that we just finished. So as I come to the end of my segment, um, I emphasize the, uh, the challenge of that shoreline area, the shore, and yet, um, you know, I think there's a lot to draw on, and that's what you, hopefully you'll get a sense of in the rest of these presentations. We have a lot of incipient kind of prototype efforts going on around the edge of the bay with um, important, with you know, potentially important approaches, 
but they haven't really gotten to the level of scale or ambition to really have an effect, to have the impact that's gonna be needed. And that's where I think the creativity and the talents on these teams, we're really excited about that. If these could take this work to the next level and really start creating the, you know, the, the systems of between from trees to meadows to wetlands to floodplains to the bay that create functional connected networks through these systems, through the cities into the bay that are going to create the resilient systems that we really need in the future. So that's the end of my segment. Do we have like a couple minutes for questions? Yeah. And then we'll go on to Letitia's. Everyone's tired. Oh, yeah. Oh, there you go. Oh, I was just going to ask if there were any places where that lateral ecosystem action has been restored um, that also have flood concerns played into them in terms of adjacent communities. Right. Have we actually demonstrated that anywhere? Probably not at the full scale we're talking about, but I think we have some elements. Jeremy will talk a little bit about, um, we are doing that, we have a project called Flood Control 2.0, which is, is actually about the reconnection between creeks and the baylands. We'll show a little bit of examples from that. There's the reuse of wastewater and that water stream. So pieces of that are there, probably not the full expression. Other questions? Oh, in the way in the back. Is there another microphone? Yeah, I think we can do that. <laughs> Will we be posting this online anywhere? And yeah, I think we can do that. And um, Julie, Julie's going to tell us, we, we have some website. We have a website we created for, um, we actually, we, we finished rapidly to be ready for this competition um, called, and it's resilience.sfei.org. And so we have a lot of the things we're talking about, pretty much everything we're talking about would be accessible through that in terms of data layers and maps, the resilience framework, some of these examples that I was just mentioning. There was a question back there. Hi. Oh, microphone. Love your presentation. So my new favorite teacher, Klaus, talked with us yesterday about migration from the coast, much like you spoke about how our indigenous ancestors have done. What role do you think that plays today with our designs, especially with all of the development? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I'm hoping you guys take that one on. <laughs> I think you're in a great position to advance the convert, the challenging conversation on that topic, because it's really hard, and we haven't gotten into it in a very serious way because it's just too sensitive. But clearly, that's true, and this is true. So there's there's a collision of sort of realities, and I think. Um, <laughs> well, I think we're obviously. I think we're going to need to be starting to think about that. Can we protect everywhere? Um, and how long. I think it'd be really neat if there were projects that, you know, maybe it's not possible to move right now because there's too much investment and it's not threatened enough yet, but if projects could be designed that are in the context of steps that are gonna be taken and they don't foreclose, but maybe even open up those steps or start redesigning for that realignment, you know, I think, and I think just starting to get pictures and, and views and, and uh, images of what that might look like um, and engaging with communities about it so that it's it doesn't it's not coming from you know a top-down place but it's sort of a recognition of the challenges that are going to that are going to be there in subsequent generations and that we might it, yeah anyways I'm sure we'll talk about that a lot more um, I think I'm supposed to be done Okay, Ellen's gonna ask it anyways. <laughs> oh, thank you. Robin, uh, the slides were great, except I couldn't identify that green, gooey, slimy uh, design that you had in some of your slides. That wasn't the shoreline, because the shoreline was back behind. Oh, yeah, what do you consider all, all that? <laughs> okay, <laughs> nice. <laughs> I, there's no legend. Um, yeah, right. Um, I wondered if anyone would point that out. It's a fair point. So this comes from a, a big study we did recently with BCDC and, um, and AECOM 
uh, defining the infrastructure that bounds the shoreline. So this is kind of what you would consider, this is choosing that line around the entire bay, essentially the first line of defense, whether that be a soft line or a hard line. So, it, um, so that's what that is. So that is one definition of the shoreline. Another definition of shoreline I think you're saying is more out here which would be essentially where high tide would go if there were no barriers. And I did, that did cross my mind when I saw this too, is that maybe we should put the line here. But really the point is there's many lines and it's all part of the shore. There is no shoreline is sort of our conclusion. So that's why we try to use the term shore, as Letitia and um, this great historian pointed out. Shoreline is a concept that we created relatively recently, whereas people used to live in the shore and it's, it's different, it's all different zones, it's a zone.